Hacker Space. I celebrate all of you coming back uh, and seeing regular faces uh, because our dream is that this is not a webinary type thing, but it's much more of an ongoing conversation where everyone joins and everyone participates. Um, and to that end, we are trying to get it to be much more participatory. Um, because the idea is to build a body of knowledge through this. That's one. Uh, I was spending just website, which far really can pop up onto the, onto the thing, but every single talk week by week is up there. So even if you miss one, you can still access it. Um, I wish I could find a way to get it editable into a very nice, neat podcast, but they're just worth putting in your ear while you're chopping vegetables and stuff. Invite. Hi, Carol. I'm so happy you came back. Hi, I'm sorry. I cannot get on camera. That's okay. You're here. It's vanity. But I am very happy to be here. Very, very happy. Yeah, Hi, Amy. So yeah, Jay Han. New York is here. Yeah. Um, all kinds of places are here. Um, but uh, without further ado, uh, really, also, if you think that there are people you would like to hear, and uh, if there are thing, people, conversations you want to have, just reach out to any of us, Amy, Ngeni, Wenya, um, whoever you fancy, me, and um, notice how I said whoever you fancy, and then I said me. Uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and just uh, really um, keep the conversation alive and keep it going forward because we're all on quests here to figure out how we want to, what we're going to do with this great unrealized future. So I shall leave it now to my. And I'm Amy uh, to take us off and go. Great. Thank you, Jehan. So, um, uh, welcome to everybody and uh, to my guests this evening, Asher Warren and James Brennan. Thank you for, for uh, appearing with me tonight um, in this um, Hobart and Launceston, Tasmania centric um, uh, uh, session of Unrehearsed Futures. Um, so uh, this is number five of our second season, and it's entitled Carcerality, Ritual, and Spectatorship, Prisoners Coming Home. And so um, we're going to be looking, uh, in the first half hour, we're going to be looking at the work of James and Asher, James in particular on uh, carcerality and theater in prisons, and Asher on his work with audiences. And um, <clears throat> so I'd like to... Uh, break with my tradition of reading out people's bios and ask my guests to introduce themselves, because uh, I think that will be much more lively and interesting. So uh, may I begin with you, James? Um, sure. Uh, thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Amy, for the intro. Um, I hope I have something to offer this room. It feels like a really an amazing, I, I can't really tell yet because I've shrunk everyone's heads, but it feels like there's a lot of experience and enthusiasm, wisdom in the room. So, hi. Um, I, I'm in Tasmania uh, in Australia. And one thing we do here um, when we um, speak on country, which is what they call, you know, a word used here for the land here, is we um, acknowledge the traditional owners. So I'll do that even though we're everywhere because I'm on, I'm on this land here and it's a, it's a, a practice that we, um, we try to honor at all times. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm paying my respect to the traditional and original owners of this land, Tasmania specifically. Hobart, the Lutruita, the Mawinana people. Uh, and that means paying respect to those who've passed before and also acknowledge um, the current Tasmanian traditional owners who are still here. The land was never really ceded. Um, so it's important to start with that. It's also a pretty strong intro to my obsession with justice because there's a lot of injustices happened on this country and um, continues to, but I'll get to that later. I'm gonna try and talk about myself without um, 
as dispassionately as possible for the next little while. Um, so I guess the intro, the main thing to say is, I'm, you know, I'm an artist. Always, I've always been working as an artist with, a, with an exception of a little break I, got, I had when I got bored and I became a parole officer for a number of years. But mostly I, I trained as an actor and I worked in the theatre um, uh, for the last 20 years. I did a bit of straight theatre and I found it pretty uninspiring and I, I guess I started to make my own work early on. Well, as soon as I as soon as I was training, really, and that um, came out of um, I guess disinterest in the work that was around me, or more, in a more constructive way, an interest in making work that was more physical and, and experimental than what was in where I where I trained, which was in Melbourne. Australia doesn't, you know, talking about theatre in Australia is an interesting. It's a, sort of an interesting thing to do. Asher might have something to say about that later as well. It's, you know, the tradition here is um, limited and you might say that the, um, we might not be um, suited to certain types of theatre just because of our sort of national psyche and our history. Also, there's a lot of elephants in the room, which seems like a good thing for theatre, but in, in Australia, sometimes it hasn't been the case. Anyway, elephants in the room is something that's, is, 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 is something that's compelled me in all sorts of directions. Or, um, for the last 20 years. I'm a musician also, and I've always, I've always made and performed and composed music. But I decided early on that I would not study that afterwards because I wanted to keep it a bit sacred. Funnily enough, I did study theatre and that's what I've been doing pretty much all the, the whole time. Um, so I uh, was interested in mime and physical theatre early on and, um, I made my own theatre for a while, probably 10, 12 years off my own bat and did that sort of continuously and eventually got a bit jack of the culture. Um, that means I wasn't, I, I was not sort of, I didn't have enough contemporaries around that were doing what I wanted to do. So um, I had a break and went to Berlin and made music for quite a while. And when I came back, I just, I actually just didn't want to make theatre, so I became a parole officer. That was a pretty sort of odd, um, there's a story there which I won't go into, but it didn't, I, didn't, I didn't hunt it down, it sort of happened to me. It was great. If anyone ever wants to try and become a parole officer, <laughs> if you're getting bored of theatre, I highly recommend it. You know, I guess, you know, I guess one thing that was missing for me in the theatre was a sense of danger or rawness in the in the work, and I didn't know this at the time. But when I went into the into the prison, well, you know, I mean, those two things immediately changed for me. Of course, I made some pretty strict rules that I wasn't I wasn't going in there to sort of harvest stories for my own theatre. I was I was having a break, um, but I loved it. You know, I was a little bit of context is I was. When I worked in the community, I was um, I was managing offenders in the community. That meant people who'd come out of prison or people who were on community orders, and there was a whole range of of sort of situations and and um, people um, in in quite a poor sort of crime uh, high crime neighbourhoods where I was working in the west of Sydney. Um, I. You know, I interview, the main task you do is you interview people. You get to know them, you get to know their backgrounds and the issues they have and their, you know, what, what, what's called in parole offending behaviour. You're supposed to understand that and anything that feeds into that. So it's a, I, mean, I found it quite in, incredibly privileged sort of um, role to be able to get all this information about individuals. I just thought it was so... It was just so unusual. I just, if, if anyone had handed me the files that I was reading years ago, I would have just been gobsmacked. There's so much information about people's lives, their personal stories, um, and it's compelling, you know, if, um, it's compelling stuff. Of course, it's attached to a real person, so it's, it's obviously very um, difficult material with real, you know, real risks involved in their lives. I... I 
I eventually moved to the prison where I worked for three years, and that was a different story. Everyone was always on time. <laughs> I, I didn't have to go out into the community finding people. They were all there. Um, and my task there was to assess them for release. Um, and so I really had to get my head around where they were at. And that really meant getting to know them quite well. Um, you know, you've got different sorts of parole officers. I think, you know, I, some of them probably thought I was a bit of a pushover because I was interest, so interested in their, um, you know, their reasons and where they got to where they'd got. Um, the reason I'm telling this story is because it really has driven everything I've done for the last eight years. There was one interview in particular uh, where a guy, a guy was involved in quite a serious um, series of crimes and we'd got to this point of trust and he broke down and confided in me some further crimes, which he hadn't been charged for. And um, I knew that I needed to report those crimes, those alleged crimes, and I, um, of course, I, I was able to tell him that after, but the thing that struck me was the interpersonal relationship between us had got to this point where something transformative was potentially unfolding. Unfortunately, it was not in my remit to go down that path, you know, to get stuck into whatever was unfolding for this guy. It was, it was a breakthrough, in my opinion. He was facing something really significant. And as I left that interview, I mean, I, I knew that I was, I was confident that it would not, this would not carry on in a way that I was interested in carrying on. Um, that is, you know, getting people involved um, who understood the psychology of what was going on, et cetera, in order to sort of harness this transformative moment. Well, potentially transformative moment. Um, as it played out, I went back and reported to the police and, you know, the, the psychologists got involved and, and nothing much came of it for him, that individual. I found that terribly disappointing. The one sort of moment that should be capitalised and sort of just everyone sort of gather around and pay attention to this moment wasn't able to be handled in the system that I was working in. That really led me to uh, make a work called The Chat which was a, a, a theatre work, which was um, basically about inventing a utopian parole system. It was, to it was meant to be ludicrous, you know. Um, we, went for, we went all out um, playing with the idea of what would, make a, what, what would make a utopian parole office. Dancing, playing, um, uh, games, sensuality, you know, <laughs> all the things that you just, you couldn't dream of when you're working in a parole office. It just doesn't match. But I was with a bunch of people who were well suited to that, those sort of things. And anyway, what, what came out of it was very surprising. Um, it was made with um, three, including myself, three experienced performers and four um, ex-offenders. And it's been, we did multiple iterations of it. And uh, so I worked with training up these ex-offenders to be ready for performance with, with my colleagues. And they were on stage every night with us, semi-structured performance going into territory, which was very sort of difficult really for them in, at moments, but also very uplifting at other moments. Um, I guess the model of that has, taken me into a sort of area of interest, which I would, I would say is thinking about what the boundaries of my, of my artistic ambition are. I think that my assessment of socially engaged art to date, I've, I've generally hated it. You would, not have, you would not have caught me having any ambition to be involved in socially engaged art 10 years ago. Art for art's sake was what I was totally about. And, unashamed about not having to answer why to that question. I just did not feel the need to answer why I, why I was making art for art's sake. I thought it was enough. And I still would defend that position. But after making a few works with these people, my, perp my, my sense of purpose is completely different and I don't think I can go back anymore. 
I just like music, which doesn't have um, socially engaged purpose, I think. But in theatre, because it's, it is necessarily sort of collaborative, I can't really go back. So I found myself, I guess, now in a very, you know, I, I have no, I didn't, I mean, I just started the ethics from the ground up. I just tried to reflect on what I thought. And it took me years to get there, to get to being ready to do it. I just could not work out how to ethically start making work with people who'd been in prison. There's so much, it's so messy. I knew how messy it was going to be. And believe me, it's been even messier than I anticipated. Um, you know, risk um, to myself and others involved is just a sort of daily reality. And um, the rewards, oh, they're unlike working in theatre uh, that I had done before. And so where I'm at now, I guess, is I'm doing a PhD about it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm applying some, apparently, applying some rigor to those questions. Um, I still feel, you know, probably as far away from understanding it as I did when I started. But probably um, I'm under, I get to understand some other people's um, approach to some of the things that I care about inside it. Um, and I'll continue to do it. I think I've, I, it's not a, I made a decision to keep doing this. I thought long and hard about whether this would be a flash in the pan a couple of years. And I decided, no, that I was going to keep doing this. Um, so here I am. I'm just about, I'm just launching a, an organisation. I'm moving away from my own artist, my own name um, as an artist, which I think my website is up there, which what's been for the last sort of while, to a company name. And the idea there is to give put a bit of distance between James and the work, um, because, and I'll finish. I'll, I'll finish on this idea. I think because basically what's what's happened is by working with people in in prison and who've been in prison and who are in and out of prison. Um, the idea of trust and my, my decision in the end to have real friendships with these people, um, not, not the professional boundaries that make sense um, in the work, um, has been really integral um, part of my work. Not one that I would put in funding application, mind you, um, or necessarily write about in my, well, maybe I will write about it in my PhD, but um, it has led to some really difficult situations um, recently in the last year, which um, I hadn't second guessed. And there's probably more of those, but each time so far, I've when I've stumbled and thought, geez, how can I move through this? Um, I've taken enough time to decide that I want to and I will. And so uh, I'm just starting this organisation. The first things we're going to be doing is making, uh, dedicating the first period to music making in prison. Prisons love music. All the stuff comes out. Um, they get to learn a bit of, you know, songwriting, whatever. And it's a real joy, you know. Music does something that theatre theater has a lot of trouble doing. You know, the immediate response is just great. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of a ramble. I think I should. I think I should shut up now. Um, there's probably other stuff to talk about. I hope. I hope that's a useful intro. Um, I, I sort of wanted to reveal some of my sort of, I guess, more personal um, reasons for doing this stuff. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. No, I think it's very um, helpful to know. Uh, your background and, and your personal experience that connects you to the work. And um, I'm sure that uh, already there's lots of, you've provoked a lot of thoughts about things. Um, Asher, can I ask you to also introduce yourself and your research? With pleasure. Can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up, all good? Fantastic. Uh, Amy, I don't think that I have as, as a compelling story as James has. I'm, I might be a bit briefer. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Um, so my name's Asher Warren. Uh, I teach theatre and performance at the University of Tasmania, uh, the same island state that James lives in. 
uh, but we do not reside in the same city. I live in Launceston and teach in Launceston, which is in the north, um, but is also uh, land which was stolen. Um, the Palawa people were forcibly dispossessed um, here, and uh, I want to acknowledge the traditional owners as well. I like to start uh, with my name and these kind of things, because uh, my name gives a lot away and hides a lot. Uh, my first name is Asher, and a lot of people uh, sometimes think that's back to front, but my given name is Asher, and it is uh, the Hebrew Asher from the Old Testament. But it is not, a. am not Jewish. My family is not Jewish. Uh, my family is actually hidden behind my surname, which is Warren, uh, which was anglicised when my grandfather landed from Holland in Melbourne, Australia, after the Second World War. It was changed to the closest thing in the phone book to Van Vuren, which was the Dutch name. Uh, so this is to kind of situate myself as a uh, second generation Australian with a heritage which I have a distant relationship to, but still uh, is a part of the identity that I have here. Um, my work up until a couple of years ago was really focused on uh, interactive and intermedial theatre making, participatory theatre, and people working, particularly Australian artists, working uh, to make really innovative work, which was remarkably open in its structure. Participants actually got drawn into these works and had quite a lot of say in what happened. They could determine where that work went. Every time those works were staged, something different would happen. So I spent quite a lot of time watching those works, participating in those works, and looking at what this meant for theatre as a practice, for performance as a practice, once it started becoming so much more dependent, so much more formally dependent on how participants uh, engage. And like actually Jane said, it really drew out the collaborative nature of performance practice in a much more kind of concrete way. Um, so that was, that was a, that's always been a strong interest of mine. What draws people to the theatre? What, what do they do in the theatre? Um, not necessarily just the artists, but audiences. Um, in 2018, I got a job uh, at the University of Tasmania, an island which I had never lived on. I knew of, had visited, uh, and started working here and experienced uh, essentially a form of culture shock, um, which was an entirely different culture of theatre making. I'd come from a large major city to a much more regional city uh, and encountered a very, very different set of attachments to theatre making, expectations of theatre, uh, and ways of valuing the work. And since then, uh, this has really kind of like reoriented me to start asking the same kinds of questions about what are you doing at the theatre? Why are you making theatre? What, what are you doing when you go to the theatre? Um, of this set of regional audiences. Uh, so this has kind of been my recent turn. Um, and it has been really interesting engaging with this regional theatre culture because it is remarkably self-sufficient. It's so kind of powerfully um, self-contained. It doesn't need external validation. But what that has meant for me as a scholar and a critic uh, is that I'm not necessarily always welcome and uh, it's been very difficult for me to become a part of this community and to engage with the community. I think I'll stop there because I think you have some questions for us, Amy. Well, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting that you, you, um, that you, you stop there because, uh, because I, um, I, I think I have an excessively ambitious list of questions, but um, uh, when you when you speak of uh, having difficulty feeling part of a community, that leads me uh, to wonder uh, what theater is for, and I think that's something that uh, you might have different answers uh, 
for that question. And, and, and then it'll be interesting to find out what the room thinks about it. But um, you, when we talked about this before, actually, you talked about a kind of cruel optimism. And uh, so I was wondering if you would segue into that uh, reflection on, on yeah. what's, yeah. Certainly. Um, so yes, this is to, to borrow Lauren Ballant's wonderful, wonderful phrase, cruel optimism. Um, I, I first started thinking about our attachments to the theatre when I, um, I had been ruminating on a series of uncomfortable moments, watching work in, in Melbourne, actually, um, some which were uh, very awkward, one where an elderly uh, audience member got up and walked out of a show during a performance, uh, and the, the actor on stage uh, turned to her and addressed her and said, thanks for coming, great to see you. Mind you, mind you step on the way out. Um, and I was, I was torn because I felt, yeah, you shouldn't walk out, but, you know, just go on. You've taken us out of the moment of the show for actually like a pretty self-serving go, right? Like you're, you're doing this for you. This is meant to be about us. Um, and so I had this, I've, I've called them in this paper that I wrote about this. I had a sneaky feeling and it was a, this feeling that scratched at what was happening on stage and took me out of the suspended disbelief that I had given and I couldn't stop thinking about it. I was in, but not in that moment. Um, and so I, I, all of a sudden, as soon as I started thinking about these sneaky feelings where you're watching a show and all of a sudden you're not there because something has broken the effective machinery of the theater. Um, I realized it related a lot to the kind of attachment that we have and, and the willingness that we, we bring to the theater to kind of get something. And we, we have this expectation, and I think the cruel optimism sums it up nicely because we, we have such high hopes for theatre to deliver us moments of beauty, of insights, of pathos, of bathos. Um, and so often, at least in my experience, they don't happen. <laughs> I sit through a lot of bad theatre, and this is perhaps because I sit through a lot of student theatre. <laughs> um, uh, but I continually return uh, and sit with this kind of optimism that it will happen. Um, that optimism is really different in, in Tasmania um, because it seems it, it seems much easier to satisfy, and that bothers me. Mm. People don't have as high a hopes of the theatre. Um, and so they are kind of, you know, more readily satisfied. Their optimism is direct. Yeah, no, I won't say that. But I, I might give that to James now. Well, well I, mean, I, 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 I mean, I'll say one thing about that. I, I mean, I'm fascinated by those moments and I think that they are compelling theatrically. And I think I probably have obsessed a little bit about um, capturing them and reworking um, them for my own theatrical purposes. Because, you know, when you've got shit theatre and that can still happen, you've sort of got good theatre <laughs> because it is compelling. That moment is absolutely, you know, it's awkward, sure. But, you know, you're paying attention and it's there's a lot of tension, there's tension, there's uncertainty, there's surprise, and you know it's got all the it's it's got all the ingredients that make me my ears prick up in the theatre. So uh, I I think when you described that, I was like, oh, that's interesting. I mean, I, I'd do something with that, couldn't you? And I think that I I in the theatre I've made in the last two years, I've I've been I've been really um, playing with uh, the the inadequacies or the elephants in the room as, um, as content and as form, really, because I know that they work in this context anyway. 
you know, I am I am absolutely obsessed with high art, beautifully performed, impeccable theatre. I love it. I want to make it. I want to be in it. I want to like live it. But it's not happening in Tasmania right now. I'm just like forget about it. And that's where I live. Now, uh, what have you got then? Well, you got that. What you've just described. And I. I don't think that's the answer to how we make good theatre here, but but it's it's a little window into your question, Amy, of what's art for. I mean, I I don't I don't really know what art's for. I don't think I'll ever know, but I do, but I do I did become obsessed with what art can do. And I at the moment I'm like I have sort of social purpose in my work, and I know there's some things it can do, and I've learned about a few. Um, it can make someone who's marginalised feel um, part of something. It can um, make money for someone who doesn't make money. It can, you know, there's all these sort of practical things and then there's more ambitious things. But um, so I guess when, when I think, when I reframe your question as can do, it really changes things for me. And I think that my ambition, which has changed in the last eight years, has landed on that because I never had any interest in working out what art was for, what it was. I was just like, I'm in it, it's cool, art's cool. <laughs> I like it. Um, but when I found purpose, then I'm like, well, actually I've got some tasks now and how can I do them using some of, this, some of the stuff I got? So I, it's interesting to go, I don't know if, if I wanna go in deeper into Ash's moment or take it away, but it is to me, fascinating stuff the awkwardness that asher is obsessed with i would say is that fair to say asher? those 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 moments of awkwardness yeah. Um, uh yeah obsession yep yeah positive I, I, obsession's a good thing in my mind um i think that you know they they're, they're the clues to our little tiny crappy palette theatrical palette that we have in australia um you know you got one of that's one of the little things you probably want to keep on the palette, um, or or train up and be you know brilliant, um, you know I, um, experts. I feel I feel like there's something else that I want to add to that question that that you've raised, James, which is theatre is good at creating communities, performance events, and the the act of making theatre. Is, a, is an amazing uh, moment of bringing people together with a shared purpose. Because um, it takes so much energy. Like, how can you not be invested? Um, but for me, the, the interesting thing about that is that the cohesiveness of that group that comes together in the groups that I'm seeing around me are exclusive and exclusionary. And, and they're based around um, so often a kind of we are separating ourselves in order to define ourselves more clearly as something. Um, and that has been the, the real kind of trouble because I, you know, I, I see it when I see the students that I have audition for these shows and they're excluded because they're not in with those people. Um, or they've said something about a show that they didn't like, or that there was, you know, they've they've raised a criticism and they're not allowed to, they're blacklisted. Um, so the the kind of like, you know, the the two sides of creating communities around an identity, when those identities are, you know, complicated or you know, clearly defined, they're also methods of exclusion. Um, uh, there's some very interesting questions already in the chat about um, the question, a question being raised about social engineering in terms of uh, the creating of community around theater. And then also a question about utopia or a reflection on utopia on your part, Mwenya. Um, the room is small enough that I just think it would be really wonderful if people would just unmute themselves and, and speak out the question. I, I don't think I'd need to curate from the chat. So I'd, I'd appreciate that if people would just um, sort of you know, basically I mute to make their reflections. 
Yeah, Han, did you, you want to? How does the hierarchy work? Most interesting question, or the one at the top? Uh, I, I try to I try to go from from the top. Um, so okay. Jehan, I think you were the first. I I actually think maybe because uh, you know I'll I'll speak at some point, but maybe we can go with Clark because I haven't just opened it up to people non curatorial. I don't know. What do you think? Otherwise, I can go, but up to you, Amy. You decide. Okay. Um, well, I think the, then I would be asking Wenya if you wanted to talk a little bit about um, your question about utopia, this, whether there's a utopian quality in, in, in the projects uh, that, you're being, that are being described. That is, you're pointing to? It's yeah. the other side. Huh? I'm pointing to <laughs> Morgani, <laughs> who is right here on my screen. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, thank you both for those uh, really kind of rich initial um, kind of opening thoughts. And I guess, Asha, what, what I was hearing as you're kind of thinking around um, this question around, I guess, and, and um, James picked it up, you know, and what work does the theatre do? And, and perhaps this connects to a question of ethics, right? Is we can engage in art for art's sake, but we also seem to be recognizing that perhaps that's an insufficient grounding for an ethical practice of theater making. I, it's the question I'm asking, right? Um, but I immediately suddenly thought of Joel Dolan's, um, I put the book in the um, comments, The Utopian Performance, Finding Hope at the Theater, where she kind of engages with exactly what it means to um, approach the theater with, I guess, you know, to use the term you're using, cruel optimism, um, and still somehow even in the recognition that perhaps the performance event doesn't leave anything that's specifically tangible afterwards, that there is some kind of utopian impulse that, that, that allows us to generate something hopeful, something meaningful, just in the act of gathering together. And I think the words she uses are embodied, passionate, and live in the same space. Um, there's an interesting tension there, right? This desire for the, for the work to be larger than itself, but also recognizing that the fact of sharing space in and of itself is, is perhaps beginning to crack open um, the ethics and politics of what we're doing when we're sitting in those spaces together. Um, it also connects to, uh, ah, I've lost the train of thought, but yeah, so there's, there's that, that, that kind of interesting tension for me between this kind of cruel optimism and the utopian impulse nevertheless that, that perhaps might emerge in spite of the cruelty of that optimism. Yeah, or, or precisely because of, mm. um, I, is it Helen Ibol or there's a great phrase talking about one-on-one uh, -on -one theater that came out of some, some research about the, the desire to give good audience when you attend, attend the theater. Um, and I, I, had a, I had a lovely conversation with a friend a little while ago who um, found it, he just couldn't, explain why he was so disappointed in the show and he puzzled and and spent the time interrogating himself and interrogating what he saw to process his thinking and it was like i i was at that show too and it wasn't underdone work it wasn't fully kind of fleshed out and it really needed more time but he felt bad in that moment to kind of like not have a good response to it. And I'm like, and I was struck by him feeling bad as that utopian impulse, right? Like that's the manifestation of the utopian theatrical impulse that you've internalized this desire for it to be good. Like um, so much so that you're kind of pained by it. Uh, I'm sorry. I think the, the problem is not enough people. I, 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 sorry. <laughs> I yeah. feel like there's not enough people that feel bad about bad theatre. Can I, can I add a thought there? I think that when you add social purpose, let's just call it, say social purpose to a theatre work, your right and almost responsibility to be that sort of crude, um, real audience who just, you know, like an old 
um, like in old times, you know, you, you, you look away or have a beer when it's boring and you, you clap when it's good. I think that the, 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 the contract has changed, that there is a different um, requirement um, on audience now when there is social purpose inside the work. And that has to do with the, the ambitions of the work itself. Um, you have, in a way, and you know, and, and theatre, um, look, a lot of socially engaged theatre, I'd say, including some of what I does, doesn't necessarily always do a good job of conveying every, all of the ambitions and all of the history of the work that would lead you as an audience to be responsible for that. However, it doesn't change the fact that when something is made and it has a purpose which is beyond, way beyond entertainment, then there, well, this is a question really, then possibly the, um, the contract is, is shifted. You know, what is now, if that's the case, um, if the work is aiming to create a precedent for reform, for example, and it was an experiment that is to be um, tested and applied in a, in a real context, a political context or a social context, then surely that would, would shift that contract in a way. If you are an audience member who gives a shit about that stuff, then... So I guess what I'm getting at there is maybe we're not in that same state anymore. We, our, our right to entertainment has shifted. Um, we can't, as audience, we can't respond. Um, surely the audience role has shifted. If we assume the artist role has shifted and that we can no longer just make art for art's sake, then perhaps then there's an implication for the audience too. I'm not saying, well, I'm not sure what I'm saying what the, there, but it's, it's really a question. And, I, and I, I, I imagine that there's been, a, there's a bit of mixing up of, with artists at the moment, and it's socially engaged art generally, about what is trying to be achieved. I've seen a lot of socially engaged art, which is thinking it's gonna do something and I'd say it doesn't do that. Um, and, then you go, the audience goes, well, you wanted to change the world and you didn't do anything. So what, you know, I'm going to look to the entertainment and it wasn't entertaining. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, and I think when I talk about, when I, when I talk about utopia, I, I, I'm really talking about the, the attempt to jump past a problem because art can do that. You can launch yourself beyond the usual um, obs obstacles to the to a possible answer, and you don't have to get involved in all of the obstacles. I mean, that's what we do. That's what I've been doing with some of the former prisoners: is that we don't have to focus on their offending. We can just leave that all completely out and get them to focus on their um, positive traits. Now, you can't do that in prison, but that's utopian, right? But it does come up with some solutions. James. Um, I'm going to direct uh, the utopian uh, reference uh, to Clark's um, question in the chat. I'm having trouble reading the chat. Um, uh, Clark, do you want to unmute yourself? And thank you. Yes. Um, <clears throat> uh, I recall reading in the description for this workshop something about returning rituals for ex-prisoners. And I think that was in reference to your work, James. Yeah. I was wondering if you could say something about that. I found that very interesting as a notion coming from a theater perspective. I'd be really interested to hear about that work. Um, well, it's thanks for the question, Clark. It's it's um it's research uh, really at the moment. Um, some of the work I've done to date, I would describe it as as reintegration rituals um, for the people taking part. It wasn't intended to be that, but it sort of turned out that way and, and what that really means is that the, the feedback and the sort of evaluation of the project revealed that the process and the outcomes of the art had um, the effect of 
integrating them both internally and externally. And what that means varies greatly, but there's a there's an internal reintegration, I think, for them, which is just them going, sometimes it's just as simple as, I'm not a bad person. I'm not an all bad person. And I, you know, they sort of work something out internally. And externally, it can be as simple as working in a group and what that does for a person who's not used to um, having a cohesive social experience. Um, the research at the moment, which Asher is well um, aware of because he's involved, <laughs> um, is, uh, is seeing if I can sort of answer the question about whether or not uh, performance and experimental performance in particular can serve as a reintegration ritual for former prisoners. And the idea there is um, that to build, to build a ritual with a prisoner and work with them to develop and deliver it on on release from prison and what is a ritual you know I don't quite know yet I mean I'm studying it but I I can't tell you and I think it can be something as small as a handshake and something as big as a the biggest parade you've seen in your life you know it's um, it, I hope to try and make something that is really uh, but at the end of the research, there's going to be an example which sort of tests out the findings, I guess. So um, I think that the research is is just applying pressure to the concept. Um, the reality is that I I think that my work, in some ways, doing it each time I'm doing it, um, and it, and I um, I, I I'm, I'm I need to learn more about what ritual can do and what it is um, in order to be more confident about speaking about this stuff. But um, it's sort of, that's sort of really it, I guess. Is that, did that make, does that make uh, any sense? Well, it certainly did make sense to me, James. And I'm, I'm really glad you're doing that work and I'll be fascinated to read about your discoveries and to hear about them. Thank you for doing that work. Appreciate you saying that. Clark, someone who knows quite a bit about ritual and theater. That's basically oh. specialty, isn't it, Clark? Uh, well, I, I, I sort of cross applied theater and, and psychodrama. And so a lot of the, the heightened aspects of communal experience that are captured in that mode of working. Yeah, so that, that really uh, intrigued me. But uh, I, I think I'll leave it there just to say, I'm, I'm really excited about uh, hearing about your work there, James. Oh, thank you. I think it's very interesting that we've gone from a discussion of utopia to, to hope to healing. There's, there's a kind of, there, we seem to be in that terrain. Um, there, there's the idea that there is something called bad theater has sparked some, some, uh, uh, some thoughts here. Veronica, do you want to, can you unmute yourself to talk about your problem with the notion of bad theater? Or do you want me to read out? Sure. Hi. Um, I, uh, yeah. So I think it's it's pretty much encapsulated in what I've written there, but it also strikes me um, that it is to do with the the tension between process and product, and so uh, the idea of creating rituals for in re-entering society or um, creating rituals that have to do with perhaps um, psychodrama, or to, to be in a process where people are asked to be socially reintegrating or um, kind of learning about themselves, which is very much process driven, sometimes needs a product to fulfill a, a contract to themselves in the process. And that may be bad theater but it's, it's in the eye of the beholder. And so I really 
have a problem with the idea of bad. Sorry, Veronica, you've got sorry. mute. Oh. oh, sorry about that. And so I have a problem with this idea of bad or good theater because in a multicultural, multilingual, multi everything society, um, and across the world with the, the enormous numbers of uh, aesthetic choices, the, the range of uh, cultural forms of expression, it's, it's, uh, it's it, when I hear bad theater um, as a term, and sorry, Asha, I'm not getting on your case, um, or maybe I am, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I start to think, okay, it, it bugs me because I always think it's to do with the Western benchmark, with the Northern Hemisphere, um, Western dominance of aesthetic criteria. And it really annoys me because um, the Global South or whoever um, are often judged and applied theater is often judged. And, and I use unapologetically use the word applied theater because Aish, you know, really life is complicated. Let's just accept that there's problems with the term. But when it's, uh, you know, that it's bad theater, why is applied theater bad theater so often? Well, to whom is it bad? And how do we consider the context of, of what what process has been followed in order to make that piece of work? Uh, for whom is it most important? Is it for a, a fee paying audience, a, a, a ticket buying audience? And then why have they come to that? You know, if they've come as an act of solidarity, well then who cares if it's bad? If they've come to be entertained, well, they shouldn't have come if they wanted mindless or aesthetic high art, you know, all these terms really begin to frustrate me as a practitioner also um, with um, ex-prisoners here in Cape Town. So that's my 10 cents worth. Thank you, Veronica. Do, do um, James, do you wanna answer that? That's, you've on your- I mean, I, I just have one, th I just have one thing to say about that really, is that um, it reminds me when you go and see uh, a show made by kids, um, no one hates it. Right? Um, it's, I think just because they understand it. They understand it fully. They don't know what's going on. So I, I, I use that sometimes because in the, when you go and see your nephew or just anyone's nephew or kids theatre, your your enthusiasm is is flowing from goodwill um, and adoration and and also an understanding of the context. <laughs> I think you fully understand the context and the process. And so I think I only say that, Veronica, as an example of um, when um, there is full understanding, then sometimes there can be there can be really high enthusiasm and, and goodwill from an audience. It doesn't have to all be goodwill. It can be an alternative. When you're not when they're grown up, those same kids grown up, I think that that the goodwill can be replaced with other things, but it can be um, it can come. I think yeah. Going back to that other point, I think coming from understanding. And maybe that's a that's a role of the artist to spend more time working out how they can convey what they think needs to be known about that artwork, not just the artistic outcomes, for example, and finding interesting ways to um, enter into a dialogue with the audience, maybe beforehand, maybe as a as a, a ramping into the work, maybe as a conversation after or whatever. I think. Um, just judging it on the work itself is always going to be troubling for someone. Jenny, I'd like to move on to your comment, but I just want to first ask Asher if you'd like to reply. Yeah, I think so. Um, I think it's probably like I, I really appreciate 
the distinction. And I, I think it's great to call that out because I don't think I mean bad theatre in a, in a vague term. I think the theatre that bothers me the most is unthinking theatre and theatre that does not engage with its purpose. Um, and so I'll, I'll, last week was the 25th anniversary uh, of a um, pretty horrific uh, event in Tasmanian history, which all of Australia saw, which was the Port Arthur, Port Arthur massacre, where 35 people were killed by a, a gunman. Uh, it led to, um, you know, uh, the, the gun laws which Australia has now, which is, a, you know, something good that is, is an outcome, but, you know, a, a horrific event and a, a kind of, you know, a, a Australia's kind of most violent um, historical gun crime. And last night I went to the theatre uh, and I saw a, a local company stage uh, the uh, play Gloria. And I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with Gloria. It won some awards in the States, uh, but it is centered around a massacre in an office in a New York publishing house. And that, sh that show last night told the story of the play, but did not acknowledge its context in Tasmania. It made no reference in the program. It made no attempt to kind of bridge the gap to what relevance that has to us here, what it means to tell that story here and now, uh, the week after we're commemorating this, you know, act of violence. Um, and for me, that was unthinking. That was a chance to, to make a show that connected to a community and people here uh, and it didn't need, like, they didn't need to do good accents. They didn't need to stage it well. They just needed to think about who they're telling that story for and why that story should be told. And so, yeah, I, I agree. There's, like, lots and lots of criteria we can measure from. But so to, to step back, like, that's what I, that's the shorthand that I'm trying to sum up when I say bad theatre. Um, theatre that uh, doesn't think about what it's, what it's doing and where it's doing it. And this is, you know, I think that this is what applied theatre does very, very well. It's very clear about what it's doing and where it's doing it. See, that seems to segue really perfectly into what your comment is, Jenny. Do you want to unmute yourself? Um, yeah, I think um, Asha came to me then that rather than bad theatre, we should think about lazy uh, theatre. Um, that it's lazy and that it's not making those um, connections. I, I just made a comment um, about the fact of we, we training uh, a lot of us as educators in this space. Um, we're training new young performers. We're training them in skills as actors or in theatre makers and theatre creators. But perhaps we also need to maybe be spending more time than we, we do at the moment in getting them to think critically about what they're seeing and to be demanding more of that as an audience. Um, I'm certainly a little like what you said, James, about theatre in Melbourne, which is where I am. Um, I don't go to see the major theatre companies because I don't want to spend a lot of money going to a play um, which has not been thought through properly, as you just said, Asher, about that, or a director's got, I've got a great idea, let's set, you know, Shakespeare's play in this particular context, but actually haven't thought about it at all. And you've got lots of money and the person right next to you who's in a wonderful big job with lots of money sits down and goes to sleep. Um, and they've paid $90 for the ticket. That's not what theatre is about. But I think audiences aren't critical enough in this country or pushing us enough to demand something that has a resonance um, from the work. And I guess that's just me thinking through what's my job as an educator with young people that may not have seen a lot of theater. Don't go and go, oh yeah, that's great. Just cause it cost me $150 and had lots of moving parts. It's great theater, not necessarily. So just trying to get those cogs kind of working which is, you know, for me as well. 
ಅಂತ Thanks for that. Yeah, Ngeni, uh, do you want to, oh, so Frank uh, mentioned that perhaps we should be using the terms uh, unthinking or thoughtless uh, theater instead of, uh, instead of bad. That seems- yeah, I think it was Asher's point. I was agreeing with Asher after using oh, the yeah. term thinking. Okay. I added thoughtless, which is just a synonym. Of yes, yes, mm -hmm. indeed. Um, um, Ngeni- uh, I, like, I, I like lazy as well. I think that's, that's good. Yeah, I guess I was agreeing along the same lines and trying to find, I, I was also kind of um, riffing on and calling back to, I think, a point that James made um, about the frustration of not feeling like you're a part of that community um, or not finding the points of access. And I'm now sitting here wondering whether that maybe isn't the exact political function that this work could potentially serve, is that I think our expectation of the contract between performer and audience is usually founded in some kind of process of identifying with right its proximity it's all these things and i wonder whether that that breaking of the, the aesthetic frame of this kind of theater whether we read that as um you know the invocation of bad theater tactics or whatever it might be is to position us exactly in that place where we recognize that we are in a context where we're engaging with people who ultimately um, for various reasons of statehood and, you know, we, we, we can discuss those ad nauseum, are actually within a caste economy economy um, that positions them radically differently to where we ourselves are sitting. So I wonder if that constant breaking of the frame, whether it's because the work doesn't meet our tastes or doesn't meet, you know, um, the aesthetic markers of good theatre, of, of, I like this lazy theatre term as well. I think it's, 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 it's more precise analytically. Um, is about that being the utopian gesture of this, this theater that fails, right? Is that the failure is the work. Um, it's that, that refusal to allow us to slip into the fantasy um, that we might occupy the same subject position as some people. And perhaps as a function of that, begin ignoring the very real kind of national, global economies of carcerality, right? That have produced this, this, this scenario in the very first place. I mean, no, go, someone's saying something. James, uh, no, I'm just, I just, uh, no, stay with it because I, I want to take it somewhere else, I think, but. I mean, I just feel like provoking myself and, and you now and, and in response to that. I mean, I think to what end, oh, Everyone's gone. Can you see me still? Oh, yeah. yeah. I guess to what end, you know, those those exercises of the imagination um, in terms of utopia and theatre making are, you know, the stuff that we're all, I think, familiar with as starting points and sometimes as endpoints of our work. Um, and if you apply that, I mean, we're getting in these terms about bad theatre and lazy, lazy theatre or um, thought, thoughtless theatre or you know, maybe brave theatre or whatever, They're, they are intentions, right? But, you know, they, they don't necessarily have embedded um, modes of, of, of gauging outcomes or um, successes necessarily. Yeah. And um, they, they're aspirational. And I think we don't necessarily or want aspirational theatre. In, in my case, I... You know, I, I accidentally, in the last work I made, which was very problematic, I think, but I, I decided that we accidentally landed on a potentially um, a, a, um, a, a strategy that could be applied to parole, parole unit. Definitely not in this current um, climate, but we landed on this thing, basically, which was an interview technique, which... I decided I'm going to pursue that and see if I can put some structure and formality around it and write it down and get some academics on board and put it down for posterity and try and plug it that, you know, one day maybe this, this is not a plug, but, you know, if you want to buy the book, you can. Um, maybe one day someone will go, you know what, we should try that weird theatre thing out because our parole office is not working that well. Why don't we try that interview technique that those theatre guys made up? 
Yeah. Now, that sounds far-fetched. I don't think it is. I really don't think it is. I've worked in a parole office and I know there are imaginative people in there. I guess my point is when you have aspirations inside an artistic context, I think it's, it's, um, it's a fun idea and an important idea to see how you can peg that to the wall somehow and see where it sticks because the life of an artistic work we all know has limits um it just comes and goes and it doesn't really necessarily mean that much socially in some ways but if you can crystallize something into something that's applicable then you can, you can gauge what you're not able to gauge inside the art making process. I've just never been, a, it's impossible to know whether you've made anything <laughs> that's worth anything when you're making art. But if you, if you sort of join a line from something you're making out into a measurable, something that you care about, in my case, criminal justice, then you've got this sort of parallel universe that you can um, crystallize these this work, this good work that you're making in the real world. And when I say the real world, that can be the stage too. But um, I think that that's one of my ambitions anyway. I'm trying to work out ways of doing that. Um, and of course, I'm not the first. Um, Nikita, sorry, has had her hand up for a long time and I'm sorry. I did she just disappear? Nikita, did you want to unmute I'm yourself? I'm right here. Yes, yes, I'm here. Um, I actually wanted to speak right after Jenny because she brought up a really good point. So I practice in India, and um, I've, I've, I have had conducted workshops in correction homes and especially worked with women um, in correction centers. And I think what I struggle with is that it is intentional theater, I understand that. Um, in India, I think it's different because the authorities themselves don't understand it. So a lot of time there's a lot of um, backlash from the authorities saying, why do you want to do this? Uh, what's the point of corrective justice? And um, to actually add to that, another point is that there aren't spaces that also train you for it. So when I began, I think seven years back, the biggest problems I faced was I did not also know how to, I, I was facilitating, but I also knew that I was filling myself with a lot of stories and there weren't avenues to go and take care of myself at times. Um, also something I constantly worried about was what if I opened a can of worms that I wasn't even prepared to handle? Um, I figured ways out. In India, there aren't many places that you can actually get trained for applied arts. Um, so now whenever I work, I make sure that I work with a psychologist or a counselor in the room so that if a can of worms is open, there is someone to handle that. But something I still do struggle with is when I am filled up to the brim, I really don't know where to take that. And I worry that it might affect the work um, and so I was just wondering if, if there are any thoughts on that. Nikita, thank you so much. That's such an interesting experience. Um, James, you mentioned how messy it is when you get involved in these projects. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, Nikita. I... Hmm. I'd say that, I mean, we've probably been doing it for the similar amount of time, Nikita. Seven years is about the amount of time I've been making theatre in prison. Um, I think, I guess I came to it with some, um, having encountered a bunch of these stories before I did it. So I was, I wasn't desensitized, but I, I, I saw a lot and heard a lot working in prison that prepared me, I guess. But I think it's hard to, you know, in, in parole, there was, the system for decompressing was to talk to colleagues because they know the territory. And so you just find yourself recounting these horrific stories and that was part of the culture. And that helped somehow. So I would say that 
talking to someone about them who you trust is is a good start. Um, and there's obviously, you know, you have to think about your own ethics about about that and what you can say and can't say. And um, but I think it's important for you if you want to keep doing the work that you have some way of um, sharing it because it can be really hard, can't it? Yes, yes. That does help, James. Thank you. I think that's also what I just by instinct do that I talk to. I make sure that I have a therapist who can take care of me so that I'm also ready to then take care of the work that we're doing. I can share I can share a couple of little tricks of mine which I'm happy to tell you, which are just part of my practice. And when I'm working with prisoners and when I'm working with prisoners, I um I have a couple of rules and one is that they can tell the truth or lie at any time. And that way, I don't know if this horrific story is theirs or if it's really happened or um, it's just something they want to express. And so that gives also, I mean, also you've got to think about them, it gives them space to tell or not tell or tell in a particular way. Because I think when we go in as theatre makers, they think that we want everything. We want to know all the gory details. And so I think you, I've, I've tried to make boundaries myself and tell them up front. You don't have to tell me a story here. Um, you're working with me as an artist and we're going to work on making art together. So sometimes that's helped. That's a wonderful thing. Thank you so much for sharing that, James. <laughs> Pleasure. That's great. And Nikita, you've seen um, uh, Ver Veronica's uh, reference to Sheila Preston. Yes, I'm just looking that up. Um, okay, so I think uh, I think we are at our limit in terms of our time. We don't have a hard stop in this um, discussion. We can have a, a a post post show discussion. So no one no one needs to leave. But I think it's uh, appropriate for me to at this point thank very much my two guests. Uh, James uh, Brennan and Asher Warren, thank you so much for Thanks. joining. Thanks so much. Evening. So much for having us both. I, it felt a real great pleasure to be in this room with all of you. So, everywhere. Thank, thank you to the room for uh, all of the wonderful remarks and participation. It's just been a really nourishing evening. And um, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, we have decided to make a bit of a shift at Unrehearsed Futures and put a call out. Um, to people in the room if they would like to co-facilitate uh, with us, especially if they have people in mind that they would like to invite onto the uh, discussion, um, that we can actually start collaborating with you um, because it is not our intention to create a weekly webinar, but rather to create an ongoing discussion um, with people becoming more and more, um, having more and more echo, you sort of echo effect of previous discussions and, and of deeper and deeper enriched field of conversation. So I'm gonna put um, the email address of my organization, info at embodiedpoetics.org into the chat. Um, please, if you have any ideas, uh, if you'd like to um, co-facilitate with me or, or one of my wonderful co-curators at any point, please do get in touch and um, suggest yourself. That would be a great pleasure to us to hear from you. So um, thank you so much to DSM and to Falguni for um, the continuing support of this project and uh, to my fellow curators, Jehan and Ngeni and Wenya, thank you for being here tonight. There, there's um, Ngeni's uh, email as well. And um, I think we will close with that. And as I said, uh, I'm just gonna stick around. So if you'd like to, you can too.